Good morning. Morning, y'all. Good morning. Hi, Susan. I don't know if you remember me. My name is Trish. Hi, Trish. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Well, I'm not. Nice to see you. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of in lounge mode. I, <laughs> I got up about a half hour ago, so <laughs> not really Zoom appearance appearance wise at the moment. <laughs> Good to hear you. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Good morning everybody else.
Bye, Mike. Mike. The air in general. Yeah. Yeah, I figured that would be my general area, but then I could like. What is this one too? That's to get that. Yeah. I mean, it was it was it was was it. You're being watched. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome to. Sunday service, and now we can get started with prayers. Matthew, we ask for someone to do the prayers because we don't have someone to do that yet. Would it, anyone like to do prayers in um, the, the online world? I can do prayers, but I gotta go get my mala. So I'll be right back. Okay. Would it be convenient for me to do prayer? Uh, Karen said that she'll do it. She's just going to go get her mala. Which is good because we're going to mess around with this for a minute. Once with some training going on right now in the audio visual group so that we have plenty of Sangha members that are trained so that we can broadcast online. Please enjoy breathing as these things transpire. Um, Reverend Saul, Bodhi, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent Holy Lama Yeshe Jinpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion, and may my intention to be a source of help and happiness to all sentient beings come through my words. Sorry, who's doing the prayers? If I could do them. Um, Can you just tell her? Uh, Karen, could you please start the prayers? Oh, I can't see them. Do I need to just go get my text? Hang on one second. How about uh, for now, I'll start with the We're seven just going to refresh our, uh, our share. There we go. <laughs> OK, so you want me to start now? Yes, please. OK. <clears throat> Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teach one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, shocker learning to I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. 
When you chief of humans were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Oops. There you go. There you go. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through vir virtue, releases from the evil gone realms. Unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings, brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, May I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the will of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of sentient being, all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Radnam and Dalakam Nyatiyami. The heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear it one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. 
At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Sharputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharvari Putra. Sharputra, any son of lineage or daughter of lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Sharputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Sharputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Sharputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, tayata, gate, gate, par gate, par sam gate bodhisoha. Tayata, gate, gate, par gate, par san gate, bodhi, soha. Saraputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. 
The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sarvati Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avogteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Hello, everyone. My refuge name is uh, Yeshe Chojur, and I took refuge with Lama Jimpa in March of 2019, and this talk is going to be about refuge. I have um, like social anxiety and talking in front of people, and um, sometimes I can get triggered so intensely that it's like a, an actual panic attack. It. Um, and so in getting ready for this, I had this memory of um, being six years old and I had uh, gotten to go to the Bahamas to visit my grandpa and grandma and my grandpa was dying of cancer and in, in the Bahamas they had uh, ex like experimental treatments going on and we stayed at this hotel that was pretty much all expats undergoing treatment so it was primarily um, people in like their 50s, 60s and elderly. And um, during like a trip to the market, I had gotten um, a puppet, a, a marionette. And I was just like so happy with it and playing with it all day. And that night there happened to be like a get together around the pool of all the, the occupants. And um, just like spontaneously I was moved and I decided to like give this puppet show you know, and, and I gave the puppet show and I was just like in the moment having a blast and um, I got done and I remember looking up and of course, you know, elderly people, a little boy giving a puppet show, they were very happy with that, with um, the innocence that I had shown and the love pouring in toward me from them, from their eyes was just, it was completely overwhelming and I had no idea how to deal with that. And I, I ran away crying. And, um, and the adults, you know, kind of like gave me some, some like, oh, you'll be all right. Oh, that's so cute. You know, I felt like even more by their words, like a little bit diminished and um, smaller by how they like brushed off the intensity of, of what I was feeling. And uh, actually, I actually think maybe I developed a habit of like running away from that intense love that's actually always available to us in creation and the fact that we're alive. And it would it's really interesting to think about that, like what if what if there was an adult there at that time that had been willing to, to meet me um, in that experience and to understand that I was actually having kind of an existential moment of, of meeting love with my community um, and if they could have been there to talk to me about what that is and to support me that actually we're capable of receiving all that's here. Um, and uh, so that idea of that support is refuge and that's, um, what I'm going to try to talk about now. There's three parts. There's like an introduction and a background to taking refuge and what that is, and then what taking refuge is as um, a religious activity or ceremony, and then uh, some ideas about how to practice refuge. Uh, so refuge is the way we seek shelter from the difficulties of life. And the difficulties of life in Buddhism, we call suffering. And so suffering comes in two types. The Buddha told the story about there's two arrows that we get shot with, two different types of suffering. Jules gave a great talk about suffering a few weeks ago. So the first one is things that we can avoid, um, often it's said as old age, old age, sickness, and death. And so this is just part of the pain of life. But those things are so heavy that we develop other ways of trying to uh, shelter ourselves from those pains and actually 
that ends up causing more pain. We get stuck in cycles. And um, what we think will make us happy causes us pain. So like in my story, running away and crying, I thought that would be a, a good idea. But it turns out running away from problems or intensity doesn't help. It's still there. Um, so some other um, very typical things that we see in everyday society are um, you know, food, we all have to eat, but we're often eating right, to suppress emotions or deal with emotions and the intensity of life. Um, being on our phones, uh, media, romantic encounters, sexual encounters, um, there's some others, uh, some hobbies. Um, uh, people get super into their hobbies to avoid life. There's um, work, being a workaholic and um, focusing only on work to the detriment of other areas of our life. We live in a very materialistic, capital, capitalistic culture. So um, going for the pursuit of wealth and material gain is another way that we uh, avoid the natural suffering in life and therefore cause ourselves even more suffering. And so the idea is that um, in taking refuge, we will have an appropriate and non-harmful way to shelter ourselves from the unavoidable suffering in life. And that we can get out of these trap cycles and begin to mature. Uh, from a, a long rim approach, we start with what's called the ordinary preliminaries to getting on a spiritual path. And um, those are also called the, uh, the external or ordinary preliminaries. So, that. so those are four things or contemplations that we need to think about that would lead us to believing that we have a meaningful life and motivate us to live a meaningful life. And that's that um, right now we have a precious human life that this is rare to obtain. It's actually very, very special that we have a human life and we're actually very powerful creatures and that our um, words, deeds, and thoughts uh, have a lot of impact uh, both on ourselves and others. And so everything that we do and think uh, matters. Uh, death is imminent. It's coming, we all kind of, act like we have plenty of time that we don't have to put work into spiritual pursuits. Like we'll just win the, this is what Lama says, like, well, we all kind of have this belief that we'll win the spiritual lottery and it will just happen for us, but actually we need to put work in and that, death is coming, the clock is ticking. And we actually don't know when that's gonna be. Like, I hope you all have very long lives, um, but unfortunately it's, it's a, uh, I'm looking for not planned. Um, the third one, this one's really important is cause and effect. We have to look at that every um, action we take has an effect and that um, our suffering is not due to external circumstances. It's about how we act and how we choose to deal with it in an internal way. And uh, this is considered probably the most important of the preliminary contemplations because it's what motivates us to really take our life into our own hands. So the importance of cause and effect. And then uh, lastly is that samsaric understanding is suffering. So that, that would be those cycles that we're, we're caught in um, that make us uh, tense, that make us paranoid, um, cause us to lash out at other people, make us jealous, all the negative afflictive emotions are very caught up in some Saric understanding. This can be further broken down into uh, eight worldly dharmas they're called. And it's like four sets of opposing um, things that uh, create the cycles. And so those are um, a hope for fear, or excuse me, a hope for gain and a fear of loss and a hope for pleasure and a fear of pain, a hope for a good reputation and a fear of a bad reputation, and a hope for praise from others and a fear of being blamed for our actions. 
And I think if most of us um, think about those four categories and kind of hold them in mind as we go throughout our day, a lot of the, the typical chatter that's going on in our heads will be related to that, like um, to justifying our behavior or like planning on how we're gonna get pleasure, how we're gonna get more stuff, gain, um, and then like, uh, trying to avoid the others. We're constantly kind of plotting and scheming along these four areas um, to keep us out of trouble in our own mind, but then that actually creates more suffering for ourselves. And this is also important because as we choose to take refuge and enter into a spiritual way of life, um, these eight worldly dharmas are considered kind of the first set of obstacles to get through, to be on the spiritual path, and then more things present themselves. Um, that's like the first level. Uh, so with that, it's also important to, to talk about uh, how to view this talk on refuge and how to view a, a spiritual path and getting on a spiritual path. Uh, so Lama wanted me to talk about that refuge isn't for everyone and it's, it's very much okay to practice in a secular way. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be Buddhist. And I hope if you're listening to this talk and, and being a Buddhist isn't something that interests you, that there's still concepts that are helpful to you. Um, Lama is also thinking about, you know, he really wants to make sure people have the proper motivation if they want to take refuge. So he's thinking about developing maybe like a, he calls a pre precept course um, that people can take uh, prior to making the, um, the serious commitment of taking uh, refuge and vows. So uh, there's three scopes. Um, ways to look at this small scope is um, someone who's very much in cyclic existence and suffering deeply and just wants out of that, wants some relief and does not want to be reborn in a lower realm. They really want to be to appear and to, to come about and manifest as a human or a god. Um, and so that's that scope. And then um, medium scope is the um, the spirit. The person is a, probably a spiritual aspirant. You call them. Um, they want to get on the path. They're ready for that, and they're really looking at that point to find personal nirvana. They would like to do the work to where I can be a happy person and, and my problems are, are very low and life is, you know, kind of manageable. Life is good. And then there's uh, the large scope and large scope is for typically tends to be people that are already on the path and um, have some experience with that. And they're really at a point of like uh, constantly kind of balancing and making the decision of, um, will I attain personal nirvana or will I stay in samsara to help all beings? And the literature uh, teachers, uh, I got the, uh, those uh, kind of understandings of scope from uh, Geshe Lo and from listening to a talk by the Dalai Lama. Um, they really encourage us to try to hear from the large scope that to be a Buddhist, we want to save all beings and that will enter into the, onto the path um, with that in mind. So kind of to recap at this point, the idea in the long run approach is like, we've started to understand and encounter our suffering. We're seeing that really most of our suffering, all of our suffering is uh, by our own cause and not facing inevitable suffering in an appropriate way. And we want to start doing that. We want to have meaningful lives. And we see that everyone else is suffering as we are and we want to be able to help them. And so then it's like, well, okay, like, now what do I do? And so the idea of refuge is that 
that would be the next step in an alarm learn approach. This is considered um, the internal or extraordinary preliminary. Um, so still moving towards getting on the path. And um, it's also like what in uh, Joseph Campbell's view of the spiritual hero's journey, this would be, um, there's the call to adventure, which would be understanding suffering and wanting to help others. And then there's the initiation and refuge is an initiation into the Buddhist path. Um, so I, uh, this part about like what is refuge as a, a religious ceremony and um, process as an initiation, I took from an article by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and I'm just gonna read that. It is, uh, I like edit it to get the ideas so it's not as long. Um, I hope it flows well. In the Buddhist tradition, the purpose of taking refuge is to awaken from confusion and associate oneself with wakefulness. Taking refuge is a matter of commitment and acceptance, and at the same time of openness and freedom. By taking the refuge vow, we commit ourselves to freedom. When we take refuge, we commit ourselves to the Buddhist path. We no longer have to run after that person or this person. We no longer have to compare our lifestyle with anybody else's. Once we take this step, we have no alternatives. There is no longer the entertainment of indulging in so-called freedom. The refuge ceremony represents a final decision, acknowledging that the only real working basis is oneself and that there is no way around that. One takes refuge in the Buddha as an example, in the Dharma as the path, and in the Sangha as companionship. Nevertheless, it is a total commitment to oneself. Still, it also includes the inspiration of the preceptor and the lineage. The participation of the preceptor is a kind of guarantee that you will not be getting back into the question of security as such, that you will continue to acknowledge your aloneness and work on yourself without leaning on anything external. Finally, you become a real person standing on your own feet. At that point, everything starts with you. So I know um, in my life, I've had a couple careers, a couple marriages, I've owned a couple houses, I have kids. And um, I was very, I, looking back, I can very much see how much I was um, caught in the pursuit of the eight worldly dharmas you know, and avoiding the unpleasurable and chasing the pleasurable and and building those things. And I would create a life and then find something lacking because it wasn't what was helping me with my suffering. And I don't mean to say that there's anything wrong in any of those um, activities, uh, hobbies, things like this. It's more about the intention in it, where if I am uh, going towards getting something for the purpose of safety, uh, for the purpose of alleviating my suffering unintentionally, then I am likely not going to be satisfied when I get that. If I'm walking a path where I have uh, safety, I have the means of dealing with my su uh, suffering directly, of processing, moving forward, and then those other things come about in my life then generally the idea is that I'll know how to take care of them. Um, Trungpa also uses strong language um, in becoming uh, very much alone, uh, which is interesting because Sangha is companionship, but it really points to the importance of understanding that each of us on our own are the cause of our suffering and that we have the power to change that and not only to help ourselves, but to help others. So um, the last section is about uh, using refuge as practice. And this isn't like the only way to use refuge as practice. This is um, one way that I use refuge as practice and 
if you begin to use it on your own, since it's such a personal experience, um, you'll come up with something for you. Um, there's also Lama has a, um, a sadhana that he put together that um, is the whole path within the sadhana. And uh, you can get that when you take refuge. All of us refuge members have it. And it's a very powerful practice. Uh, so basically taking refuge is we take refuge in Buddha's example. And for ideas about what that example is, we can turn to our prayer book. There's a whole section, um, praise to Shakyamuni, that has a bunch of attributes of what, of what Buddha, what a Buddha has as attributes. Um, and then also to the Dharma, the Dharma is the truth. Uh, the way things really, uh, things as it really is, and teachings on the truth. And then Sangha is the spiritual community. Um, so if I want to take refuge in the, in the Buddha, um, and I uh, know that there's these certain attributes like being uh, clear, open, luminous, and free, um, I kind of started to have an idea of what that is, right? Because in the teaching, so in the Dharma, um, I know that from reading those, that everyone actually already has Buddha nature. So we're all already Buddhas. We just have obscurations that keep us from fully realizing that. And because of that, then I can uh, read those words and I know that I've had those experiences of feeling open, clear, luminous, free, connected. So I can have uh, faith based in, in reason and logic with the Dharma, um, and not just take it at face value, but through experiential and logical understanding. And then since it says that everyone actually has this, like when I look about, I can see that everyone around me and actually all life that I'm encountering is Buddha. And so if I'm going to encounter Buddha all around me, I think, well, like, how would I, how would I encounter the actual Buddha? Awesome. Like I would probably really want to know what he has to say. I would be probably really curious about his perspective. And if my perspective was different, I'd probably really kind of like, hmm, like where is he coming from? Like, let's talk about this. How are we not aligned? I would probably give him a lot of respect as the Buddha. Um, I'd want to be kind. Um, probably be a little bit humble because he's a Buddha. So it's just like that would probably occur kind of naturally. Um, so now it's like in taking, in seeing everyone as Buddha, all of a sudden actually that, that is taking refuge for me because I'm encountering everyone that is external to me internally. And I think about um, experiences when someone has held that space for me where they treated me with that that type of regard where they gave me that respect and curiosity even if they lacked understanding about my position and in doing so i felt that that space actually helped me move through obstacles and so there's uh taking refuge in buddha offers that, that space of becoming Buddha for each other. And that, you know, is really, that's, I guess, what companionship, like good, non-harmful companionship is about and what we're doing here in Sangha. Um, and being able to meet with people and have friendships where these concepts are understood so that possibly we may have the actual experience of it. And uh, 
that's, I believe, um, like the safe passage aspect, you know, that uh, we can move through these obstacles that are personal together in a safe way. Uh, so the last aspect of taking refuge is the precepts. And there's uh, five precepts we take. I think of the precepts as um, uh, guidelines. I don't want to say guidelines. Like we, the law always, uh, law always says to me, because I, I like to think about the precepts like, um, the first one's I, I undertake the precept of refraining from killing. And so I've always told him, like, I like to say, uh, I undertake the precept of refraining from killing and instead encourage patience. Like, I'm not going to do this. And I feel like there's a vacuum. So I want to fill it. And I figure, like, anger, if I, you know, literally wanted to kill somebody, like, because I was that angry, like, patience is the antidote to, to that type of energy. You know, or if I, um, you know, there's an ultimate way to look at it, like even like killing, killing the energy of the moment by being distracted or, or um, having, you know, bad vibes or whatever, something like this, right? Like, so that's again, patience, right? So when I've explained this to Lala, he always reminds me, he's like, yeah, but the thing is, <laughs> is like, <laughs> we're actually stopping these behaviors now, you know, it's uh, so, I, I want to make sure that that's clear that there there is this way as we develop, I think, to use the precepts as as kind of guideposts to narrow our behavior as we move on towards what aligns with our own understanding of Buddha nature. But um, conventionally, we really need to view them as we're going to stop this behavior right now. And so they are uh, one, I undertake the precept of refraining from killing. I undertake the precept of refraining from stealing. I undertake the precept of refraining from lying. I undertake the precept of refraining from sexual misconduct. And I undertake the precept of refraining from intoxicants. And so if we do this, we now have a place of safety and of aspiration towards Buddha as the example. Um, we have the teachings that support us um, and give us ideas on how we can move toward that aspiration. And we have a community of support, of companionship on that journey. And then, so that's like, I, I feel like the soft side. And then there's like this uh, side of these behaviors that, uh, that we all do um, to some degree. And it's really paying attention and stopping us. And that can be difficult. And so with that difficulty, we need that support of the three of the, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the triple gems. And together it support, it creates a platform for us to be on a path and move forward in maturity and spiritual development. Um, in our lineage, we also take refuge in the guru in the long room approach that's um, dealt with separately. And so I'm not going to include that in the talk today. Um, I also find that the, when I am conscious and aware of working with uh, a precept or the precepts, it um, very much relates back to those eight worldly dharmas and that those things are very tied together breaking a pre if I'm breaking a precept it's because I'm caught up in being fearful of one of those dharmas or really moving toward like grasping towards one of those dharmas um, yeah I feel very complete so that was a lot um, and now it's time for questions how how will that work question? They haven't. Can't see me on online well.
raised her hand. Sorry, I'm getting cutie behind that. She's calling Karen. Karen. Hi. Um, hi, Matthew. Thank you um, for your talk. Um, it, you know, you sound you sound like you're really together, and um, it was kind of impressive to me because I find every day I've been working on the last few months um, when I start the refuge prayers, so I take refuge in the Guru and the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that I really try to take refuge. And what I found, and I, you know, I've been saying that prayer for a really long time, but um, I find that I have a lot of obstacles in my life. And, and so I, a lot of times, it's like I got my head down and I'm like going to get through these obstacles <laughs> and, da, 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 and this obstacle and that obstacle and that obstacle. And then I get to the prayer where I'm saying, I'm taking refuge in the guru and the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. And I look at the, my altar and I'm like, am I really taking refuge? You know, <laughs> it's just like, or am I just, you know, just, you know, not really giving it to them, you know, and, and not, not you, like you were talking about kind of the expansiveness of, the, of that, of taking that refuge and that it's a, something you're, con you're connected while you're, while you're doing that. And I wonder if you could talk just a little bit more about your experience with that, because I just struggle a lot with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have the same experience. Sometimes when I read prayers, I question like, well, how do I, how do I make this more meaningful? And like, how do I embody this? Um, and for me, the, the visualizations in the sadhana are really helpful to embody it. And then I think uh, rep, repetition so so I remember so these things are actually on my mind as I go throughout the day it's really helpful for me thank you for your question uh, that's helpful so Jack has her uh, hand raised hi Jack hi Matthew um yeah I th thank you so much for your talk it really uh, brought up a lot for me and I think um one thing that really stood out to me was, you know, your discussion around talking to other people, knowing that they have Buddha nature and really trying to highlight and reflect that. Um, and for one, I think that's something that you, uh, you are, are, are really, um, you're good at that. And I appreciate that. And I wonder too, if you have any, just any thoughts you can say around you know, maybe talking with people who aren't Sangha members. Um, so there was a little bit of a technical difficulty and that kind of cut out at the end of saying, if I have any thoughts about how to talk with non-Sangha members. And um, you know, still remembering, okay, they have their, and you know, maybe when people aren't, how do we do that? How do we use discriminative listening that they might be engaging in harm? I think I kind of cut out a little bit. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, okay. And they're, and they're engaged in harmful behaviors. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like um, sometimes it's easier for me with people who aren't members of Sangha because then if they're members of Sangha, if they've taken refuge, I have like an expectation of them. <laughs> you know, um, I think with if they're engaged in harmful behaviors, um, that can be really hard when we care about others, and especially if it, they're severe behaviors. And um, well, the only place I've got to is that Pete, you know, like with this, uh, it's it's really a an inside job, and so I can't get anyone to do it. Um, and the probably the most I can do is um, maybe not the most. I don't want to say that or what I've 
all I can come up with so far is to be curious with them so that they can, so that hopefully it gives them the platform to, to work through it for themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate the work you do. You're out there doing hard things. Deep breath. Oh, Andrew. Andrew has a question. Hi, Andrew. Hey there. Uh, Kind of question comment. Um, I've been reading this book. It's not a Buddhist book per se. It's called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. I don't know if anyone else has read that, but um, it's fascinating. Uh, it really kind of, it goes into lots of things, but one of the aspects is uh, some neuroscience as, as many of you probably know, uh, there's a lot of parallels between what neuroscientists are finding in Buddhism. And um, I was thinking about Jack's question. Um, we get these kind of ruts, these neural ruts, if you will, that um, kind of like the older we get, the more it's like an analogy is like uh, uh, sledding down a, a, a snow covered hill our, our brains and our minds are like, um, the more that we experiences that we have, the more that uh, there's not as much, you know, snow that hasn't had a, a path of the sled on it. So we just keep going down the same ones, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think people, you know, all of us, myself included, we get stuck so much in, uh, how we perceive things to be, how we perceive others to be, uh, the patterns of behavior that are harmful to us and others. And it's just so universal. And, you know, there's a lot of good evidence just from the neuroscience standpoint that meditation is one of the ways to uh, kind of soften those ruts so that we have fresh and new perspectives and new ways of being in the world. And um, so I think for me, it's kind of helpful when I see somebody being harmful um, to recognize that's a manifestation of their suffering. And um, I know I've been there too. So just to kind of um, not go to a judgmental place if I can help it, <laughs> but just to, to try to have compassion in that situation. So for what that's worth. Yeah, I think that's uh, very helpful. Really worth it. It's it's interesting to me that you brought up um, meditation and uh, snow, the the ruts. Um, Mom and I had a conversation um, around this a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about how shamatha um, meditation, the concentration, is is kind of like um, he didn't say snow tires, but it, it's kind of like snow tires, and that it gives us the traction and the ability to stay so that uh, when we began to to leave to chase the eight worldly dharmas that um, we begin to actually see that we're leaving and that we're embarking on this this uh, cycle of um, creating more suffering for ourselves and others thank you andrea so yeah we have a question from susan hi susan Hi, um, the, the conversation brought something to mind you know, and, and, and I realized that I've been taking um, refuge. It was hard, well, okay. Um, I've been reading the Pali um, Sutras. There's a, an anthology that Bhikkhu Bodhi put out a number of years ago. And I ran across one recently that has been really effective for me because as you said, it's an internal job and it also has to do with the precepts 
and it has to do with what you were what recently is you guys have been talking about in terms of dealing with other people and it was a, a sutra on um right speech and um that there were these criteria to that the buddha suggested would be good to contemplate before you speak which is is it um timely is it truthful is it kind is it beneficial helpful and um no that was the fifth one it'll come to me um <clears throat> and so i've been kind of and so that's kind of to me like taking refuge in buddha and dharma at the same time right because these are the buddha's words and their actions so it's when I have these thoughts towards others, I'm thinking, okay, so is that truthful? Like, is there any truth in that at all? Or am I just making this up out of whole cloth? And is this thought actually kind and beneficial? And yeah, well, not always. So um, in terms of dealing with others i'm first of all dealing as you said internally with myself is this thought that can come out in terms of speech going to meet those criteria and oh the fifth one is is it is the intention goodwill is the intention um to to is my 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 attitude one of goodwill and if i'm not answering those mostly to the affirmative then I'm trying to shut off my conversation to myself and not open my mouth and have that conversation go out into the world. Um, and so, I, I don't know, it's kind of like um, going back to the basics, just um, which is what refuge is, right? Isn't that sort of like, you know, the basics? And it was just reading this, this these, these Pali Sutras that um, I'm, finding to be really, really instructive and just so, so, so commonplace and so, so um, foundational. So anyway, for what it's worth. Yeah, that's great. Uh, another conversation with Obama, he was uh, telling me the other day that like we actually have to go on this journey where we do the highest um, teachings kind of just so we can come back to the basics. And that um, this basic work is really important. You know, it's our foundation. And it seems to me too, like the um, those those ideas for how to to speak um, would be best practiced internally, um, at least first, right? Like if I really concentrate on speaking to myself with those things in mind, um, then the thoughts that I'm going to transform. The way my mind stream is and then when i speak um, it will more likely be in accordance with those things to begin with um and i i don't know what it brings up something to me too about you know that there's no um inherently existing self to begin with so if i am regardless like in, in it's taking care of this form. Um, this form becomes all form. Sorry, that was a little wacky. Um, is there another question? Yes. Hi, Matthew. Um, my name is Trish. Uh, great talk. And at the beginning of your talk, you had made the statement. I don't know if I'm quoting you verbatim or not. Um, but this is how it formulated in my mind that sometimes with the spiritual life, we sit back and we don't take action. And I find myself doing that quite often. And I have been in and out of studying Buddhism and trying to get a Buddhist practice going on for many, 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 many years. And I guess I'm just think I am just sitting back and waiting for it to come to me. And um, so I wanted to know your thoughts, or maybe you could give me some own, uh, some examples from your personal um, story about how you got into the action part um, 
before you had uh, taken your your uh, did your ref refuge vows in 2019. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Trish. It's nice to internet meet you, and um, I appreciate that today you took action. When you're, we're here together. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think uh, I probably got in, you know, at least like it's probably a, it's a mixed bag, like all of us, right? Like we all have Buddha nature and um, and obscurations. So um, I was suffering and that motivated me to act. And there was probably um, aspects um, I was highly motivated. I used to be an extremely ambitious person. And so I, you know, wanted to be enlightened and I wanted to do things that made me look like I was an enlightened person. So I would go to, to places, I would go to Dharma centers and, and um, do stuff. So uh, that's kind of a, a personal history, but I think um, what's really, according to the teachings and teachers very helpful is um, going over those uh, four contemplations that turn the mind to Dharma, that this is a precious human life, death is eminent, cause and effect, is extremely important and um, that samsaric understanding is suffering and that if um, those are studied well and remembered, um, it'll motivate us to act in accordance with the path. Uh, Lama Jimpa often says that the primary, well, he usually sees if people kind of fall off and stop practicing, it's generally because they've lost touch of those four contemplations which are also called the four remembrances so i stopped remembering that's helpful trish Is there any other questions all right karen do you mind starting prayers Thank you, everyone. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, actions. May, I, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without, living without exception, without exception into that into enlightened that state. state. May the Supreme, the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta that has not has arisen rise, rise and grow, and grow. May that which has that arisen which has not, diminish, not diminish, but increase more and more. more. In the land encircled by snow, snow mountains, mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful channels and God's hope, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators receive happiness, happiness, and happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate and goals. goals. Low song, song. Magical, magical display of the deep awareness, awareness of all the victorious, the victorious ones. ones. Merciful Just giver of the stream of profound and vast instructions, instructions to the fortunate migrators. migrators. Please, Please remain, remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objects of compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the destroyer of sages, Losang Drugpa, I make you quest at your holy feet, Uma. Is there any announcements or anything like this? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Good, Matthew. Good, to see you. Bye -bye. Good, good work, Matt. Thank you, Matthew. 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 Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. Great talk.